Welcome everyone to the Community IT Innovators presentation on IT leadership at nonprofits. I'm excited to introduce our panelists today, Johan Hammerstrom, who's CEO of Community IT, and David Deal, who's the founder and former president of Community IT, now co-founder and partner at Build Consulting. And between them, they have decades of experience, both being executive leaders and interacting with IT leaders at nonprofit clients, whether large or small, with a variety of IT needs. So today we're gonna to talk about this theme of leadership. My name is Carolyn Woodard. I'm the Outreach Director for Community IT, and I'm the moderator today. So I'm very happy to hear from our experts. And Johan, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, happy to. Um, thanks for, for having me today on the webinar. Looking forward to discussing this topic. Uh, I've been with Community IT for over 20 years, have worked with hundreds of nonprofits in that time, and have really seen the value and importance of strong IT leadership. It's a topic that um, is kind of near and dear to my heart. So I'm I'm looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, just uh, really really glad to uh, be here today. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, I I used to be at Community IT uh, for about 20 years, and I've uh, been at Build now for about eight years, but definitely involved in uh, helping to grow those organizations and helping nonprofits to grow out their uh, technology support and IT functions. So it's definitely a topic I've. Uh, thought a lot about and worked on a lot with uh, Johan and Carolyn and, and others. So uh, really glad to be here today. Really glad to see some familiar names in the attendee list and uh, also some new ones. Um, so Build Consulting is uh, a, a team of people across the US. Uh, it sounds really large, but we're a, a small firm that works exclusively with nonprofits in the US and Canada, mostly mid-sized and large nonprofits. We are independent of any vendors, so uh, uh, whether it's Microsoft or Google or Salesforce or Blackbot or anyone else, we um, you know really sit on the client's side of the table and figuring out what's going to be best for them. So we we provide technology and data strategy uh, for organizations both in CIO roles and through assessment and software selection projects and through leading implementations, and we do that with a strong focus on organizational change management. So technology alone is uh, almost never the answer. And so we really focus on those other things that help organizations to use technology effectively. Thank you. And um, I'll jump in and talk a little bit about uh, community IT before we begin. So if you're not familiar with us, uh, we are a 100% employee owned managed services provider. So we provide outsourced IT support. We work exclusively with nonprofit organizations and our mission is to help nonprofits accomplish their missions through the effective use of technology. So we're big, big fans of what well-managed IT can do for your nonprofit. And we serve nonprofits across the United States also. We've been doing this for over 20 years. Um, we are technology experts and we are consistently given the MSP 501 recognition for being a top MSP, which is an honor we received again in 2022. So I want to remind everyone that for these presentations, as David was just talking about build um, consulting, we also are vendor agnostic. So we only make recommendations to our clients and only based on their specific business needs. So we never try to get a client into a product because we get an incentive or any kind of benefit. We do consider ourselves a best of breed IT provider. So it's our job to know the landscape, what tools are available, reputable and widely used. And we make recommendations on that basis for our clients based on their business needs, priorities and budget. The next thing we're gonna talk about is our learning objectives. Um, today, we wanted to discuss career paths and uh, ideas to identify new leaders of IT at nonprofits. We want to understand the importance of IT leaders learning to match real business needs of their organizations and IT needs with uh, their roadmap. And we want to learn the importance of prioritizing, setting the example, and holding yourself, your staff, and your organization accountable. So um, this poll is uh, interactive. So what is your role at your organization? Are you a team member? Are you a manager? Are you a director? Are you at the C-level? Are you an executive director or CEO? Or is this just not applicable to you? All right, so um, Johan, would you mind reading the, um, the poll uh, results? Happy to read them. Um, a really interesting and nice distribution of roles on the webinar today. So 
20% uh, of attendees roughly are team members, 10% managers, 40% are at the director level, 10% are at the C level, 10% are executive director and or CEO, and 10% uh, it does not apply to. So we had a really pretty much across the board in terms of who's attending today. That's great. That's so great to know. Thank you all so much for sharing that with us because that will help us um, share our conversation with you. Okay. Um, so our next item is, as if that wasn't enough, we have another poll. <laughs> we want to learn a little bit more about you and uh, keep this going. So in our second poll, what department are you in? So you are in, you could choose that you're in IT, business systems, or data and analytics. You could be in finance, HR, administration. You could be in program management. You could be in marketing and communications. That's me. Um, you could be in fundraising, advancement, um, or you could be other. This one wasn't a trick question at all. So um, it's pretty easy to know which department you're in. So go ahead, um, David, would you mind reading the results? Sure thing. Uh, this poll is a little bit more concentrated. It looks like 64% uh, of the respondents are in IT business systems or data analytics functions. 9% uh, finance, 9% fundraising and advancement, and 18% other. So no, no one identified as uh, program management or marketing communications. Great, thank you guys so much for, for dropping that in there. Okay, so knowing a little bit about you and you learning a little bit about, um, about us, we wanna go ahead and jump into this conversation. So um, I think, um, I think uh, Johan, you were going to take the lead on this slide with discussing career paths and ideas to identify new leaders of IT at nonprofits. Yeah, um, and there's you know a couple of different ways that we were going to approach talking about this issue, um, and and one of them is sort of the specific IT backgrounds that um, people have in IT, and we'll talk about that in a second. But um, one of the other ways to kind of think about developing IT leadership is to think about the different skills that are required to be an effective leader, and um, you know how does someone in IT develop those skills. So some of the um, some of the skills that are necessary to be a good leader in general, and, and generally when someone grows into a leadership role, uh, the typical path is to start at the manager level and then move up to the director level and then move up to the executive level. And and you know broadly speaking, manager is someone who oversees the work that other people are doing and helps guide and direct their efforts. A director is someone who oversees the management that managers are providing and helps to um, in, ensure that the strategy of the organization is being executed effectively. And then someone at the executive level is helping to um, develop organizational strategy, providing a long-term vision for the organization. And that's a somewhat overly simplistic way of, of looking at leadership, um, but I think it's a helpful structure for thinking about um, you know, move, moving up the ladder, if you will, if you're, if you're in IT, or if you're responsible for IT and, and you need good leadership in your IT function. Um, so starting at the management level, you know, what are the skills that are needed to be an effective manager? And, and some of those you know, might be, um, they, they start with the individual. So does, does someone in IT have good personal time management skill? Are they able to manage themselves? effectively? Are they good at, um, you know, planning out tasks and ensuring that, you know, tasks and initiatives get completed in a, in a timely manner? Um, another important skill for management is communication, being able to communicate effectively with the people that you're managing, making sure that they understand the overall task that the team is, is working towards. And then another skill is change management. So understanding the impact that technology changes and initiatives and projects are having on the rest of the organization and its use of the technology and just kind of anticipating, you know, what, what's this change gonna mean for the end users? So that's a good starting point. If, if, someone, if you're someone who's in IT and you're interested in moving into a leadership role, 
or if you're someone who has leadership responsibilities and you're interested in cultivating um, or identifying IT staff that you know show promise, show leadership potential, um, you know, starting with you know their ability to manage themselves is the good a good place to look. Yeah, thank thank you, Johan, for that. I think um, I I look at this question and I feel like it's a uh, you know provocative question. Um, like, do you have to be an IT to uh, to to become an IT leader, uh, or can you find IT leaders who are outside of the traditional IT career paths? And so, so I think it's a little bit of a false choice here with this question. I think uh, there will undoubtedly be future managers and directors and, and senior leaders on the IT track, but I think there are also those who aren't on that track who could feasibly lead IT. And a lot of times they might have a role that looks like a, a COO role or some other role that has responsibility for technology. Um, because what's needed from a technology leader at the manager level is very different than what's needed from them at the senior leader level, right? Uh, and I think they they do certainly build, each level builds on the others to some extent. Um, and wh what I mean by that is, you know, first you need to be able to manage yourself well before you can manage others well, before you can lead others. So they certainly build in that sense, but, you know, I think the career path to being an IT leader doesn't have to necessarily lead up through, you know, IT channels. I think it will 90% of the time, but sometimes you can find a great leader who's not from that path, who has supervised people on that path, who can really make an effective kind of CIO uh, for an organization. So um, I think that's one important thing I'd add to what you said. Um, you know, I think uh, it's interesting, our attendees, it's a mix of leaders who are probably thinking about how do we cultivate this uh, next generation of management and leadership, but it's also uh, people who are not in leadership roles currently. And I think for those people who aren't in leadership roles yet, um, I would offer just a little bit of guidance. Um, you know, I think I think becoming a manager, becoming a leader, it's not like a, a point in time activity. It's not a class you take. It's not a webinar you attend. Sorry, we're not going to have all the answers today. Um, it's really a, a, being a, a lifetime learner and having a commitment to that, right? Uh, and and my own path took me through things like the servant leadership school for you know classroom learning and and uh, you know probably a skill path back in the day uh, was some of the webinars I would attend and you know, peer learning programs. I was in a group called Entrepreneurs Organization. Uh, and then once I did a summer program, the, the EO MIT program, and I think all of those things were activities, webinars, uh, learning activities, each that kind of added a piece to my toolkit in figuring out how to become a, a better manager or leader. So uh, I just think, uh, and maybe we'll talk at the end about some resources for those sorts of things, but you know, uh, have that commitment to being a lifetime learner. Uh, learn about yourself. Learn what you need to do and develop to be to become a manager and leader and to become a better manager and leader. Um, and then, you know, I really think becoming a good leader is in part about knowing your blind spots uh, and then surrounding yourself with people who, uh, with team members or consultants who can see things that you can't. Uh, we all have strengths and weaknesses and, and kind of knowing yourself is one of the most uh, important steps to being able to be effective in any of those later roles, manager, director, leader. Um, I was just going to jump in to say that I did put um, a resource in the chat, and I wondered if people who are on the webinar also might want to share resources that they know of and use for leadership development and um, kind of learning these um, issues. Um, I wanted to, I'm sorry, Johan, I wanted to just jump in and ask about mentors. So I felt like I was very lucky to have good mentors kind of find me in the different places I was at when I was younger in my career. But for people who aren't having someone reach out to them to offer mentorship, what would you guys um, recommend in terms of finding mentors? Like, how do you go about that? Well, I was I was very fortunate because uh, my, my first boss was Dave and uh, he, you know, mentored me for many, many years um, in my in my leadership path and, and growing into a leadership role. So I, I was just extremely fortunate. Um, and Dave can speak a little bit more about uh, his, you know, he, I, I remember he was very intentional, um, especially in the early days of community IT about um, seeking out mentors and 
um, constantly, um, you know, finding organizations, peers, um, and other individuals that you know he could learn from. So I'll I'll let him speak more to that in a second. But um, I just wanted to just um, you know really affirm what you were saying, Dave, about um, learning and the importance of of learning. And I think that you know, that's kind of the 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 key of being a good leader is that you're always learning. Um, and you're always having to, to grow um, to be an effective leader. And I think you know, most leaders um, in, in professional services have a really strong foundation in a specific area. So if you're in IT, um, maybe you have a really strong foundation in infrastructure or in databases or in um, data analysis or data management. Um, if you're coming from operations, maybe you have a, a strong foundation in project management or in you know financial management. So I think you know a lot of leaders in nonprofit organizations, you know, start their career in a particular with in a particular area and build an incredibly strong foundation. But then the leadership path is all about adding new skills and adding new competencies that you build on top of that um, initial foundation. And so, if you're coming at IT, if you're not, if you don't have an IT background, um, but you've you know been given some leadership over IT, then you know you 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 can rely on whatever your foundational background is, but you're going to have to learn, you know, you're going to have to learn IT at some level. In the in the same way that if you're coming from an IT background and you're moving into a director role or a CIO or CTO role. You're going to have to learn how to read a financial statement. Like you, to be an effective business leader, nonprofit leader, you have to understand um, the finance side of the organization. So that's something you're going to have to teach yourself. But in the same way, if you're coming from a financial background, you're going to have to learn IT. And and it's possible. It's possible to learn it at a level um, sufficient enough to um, to be able to to lead and and oversee it. I'll just add, uh, you know, certainly, Johan, thank you for the comment. And I've learned a ton from you as well. And I feel like um, certainly uh, Chris Chang, who founded our parent company back in the day, was an early sort of mentor for me in being an entrepreneur and being a technology consultant. Um, I think over the years, the the peer learning I talked about has been such an important resource to supplement the um you know, the book learning, the webinar learning as well, because that's where you can really wrestle with, here's what I'm trying to do in my current management or director or leadership role. Here's what's working and here's what's not. And here's similar things from your peers who are in similar positions facing similar challenges. Um, I just think uh, that's part of the lifetime learning experience. You, you learn something, you try to apply it, you wrestle with it. Something new comes up that you weren't learning about that you have to deal with. Uh, and then you work through it with others. Um, so, I, you know, just one one other thing that came to mind as we're thinking about this, uh, lo looking at it from the senior leader perspective, uh, Johan, as we were preparing for this, you talked a little bit about cultivating leaders and cultivating managers. And uh, that really landed for me like that you, it's not just about picking them. It's not just about people have applied for the job and you've got to find the right one. I mean, that's part of it, but you know, every manager and leader has room to grow. And so how do you cultivate uh, the the skills and competencies uh, for them to be better managers and better leaders? Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the philosophies that I've always, um, you know, has really resonated with me is the strength, strengths-based strength approach. So Marcus Buckingham uh, and, and Gallup um, put together this strengths finder um, assessment tool. But the basic principle behind the strengths-based approach is that you find out what people are strong at, what their natural strengths are, and then you focus on building up those strengths rather than identifying weaknesses and trying to get them to make their weaknesses better. And ultimately, like leaders have to compensate for their weaknesses. So no one's good at everything. Everybody has certain things that they're good at and certain things that they're not great at. But that's the value of a team approach. You know, you if you, and if you clearly understand, I'm really good at um, communicating to users. I'm not great at business process. I'm not great at managing projects. Then you can bring in someone 
to do project management and you know provide and you're providing the vision for the project and then the other person is um you know compensating doing something that they're good at i mean that's kind of the the beauty of a of a team based approach so if you're cultivating you know leadership um and management um potential in IT it's really important to understand where people are strong and um where their weak also where their weaknesses are because i think one of the big challenges that I've seen over the years in IT is that if someone is um, with an IT background is interested in moving into a leadership role, but they're not really completely aware of the things that they may not be strong at at the leadership level, they'll tend to sort of subconsciously compensate for it by just going back to what they're familiar with, which is the technical. And they'll end up just going back and doing all the technical work and kind of falling back on that you know, because of their, um, the uncertainty they feel, you know, with a lot of the new leadership responsibilities that they've, that they're taking on. So I think it's both a combination of just being aware of that in yourself, maybe seeing it in other leaders that you're helping to cultivate and bring up. Um, and then also like telling people it's okay to be outside of your comfort zone. Like if you're going to move, you know, into leadership roles, you're going to be given responsibilities that you've never had experience with before, and that can be that can make you feel really uncomfortable. Um, but I think what you you know, if you're bringing someone into that role, or if you yourself are moving into that role, the more honest you are about it, um, the better chance you have of dealing with it effectively. There's some great points, Johan. I just want to chime in with a couple of supporting points. I think. One of the most common challenges I'll see for a new manager is exactly what you were saying about they'll fall back on what they're comfortable with, which is the the doing, the technical. And really, when you start managing other people, the the big question that comes up is what do I do and what do I delegate or you know lead someone else in doing? And that's a tension. It's such a difficult um, path to walk for for some managers to kind of figure out that right balance. Because most managers are going to need to be hands on with some things, but they also need to know where to be hands off. Um, the second thing, and this is a shout out to Carolyn, some of what you're posting in chat there. Uh, I see you posted the Clifton Strengths, um, but I think uh, to this, you know, understand your team, understand yourself, kind of that train of thought. At Build, we use Clifton Strengths and really believe in that. But things like the Enneagram or Myers Briggs or the DISC assessment, lots of different things out there to help you understand what you and what your teammates are good at and what they're not good at. Highly recommend. That's great. Thanks a lot for those um, resources. Moving along to the second learning objective of our talk today um, in understanding the importance of IT leaders learning to match the business needs with the IT needs. Um, so I think, Johan, you were going to uh, start us off on this one too. Yeah, I, I yes. I think this is one of the, this is probably one of the most important responsibilities for an IT leader, particularly at more senior levels, is really aligning the IT solutions and the IT needs with the business needs of the organization. And this is one of the areas where it's, um, you know, people run into the into the biggest uh, challenges. Um, and I think, you know, it, at the end of the day, like the organizational strategy has to drive the IT strategy. There's some parts of an IT roadmap that exist somewhat in isolation. If you have aging equipment, you know, that needs to be replaced. You know, your, your organization doesn't need to tell you that that um, equipment needs to be replaced, but what do you replace it with? You know, I mean, then you start, that starts getting into an area where making plans about how to upgrade and modernize technology really re requires an understanding of where the organization is going and what the organization's um, needs are. And so, you know, that requires communicating with the leadership and the rest of the organization, um, understanding what their priorities are and then connecting the dots between their priorities and the variety, the wide range of you know potential IT solutions that are out there. Um, but it also refers to the impact that IT solutions are going to have on the staff of an organization. So we were um, talking with a, a, you know, we were having an initial call with a nonprofit 
last week and sort of talk, they were talking about, you know, bringing us on as their new managed services provider. And we were talking about the time frame for that. And they said, well, we're building a new website right now. And then we're rolling out a CRM after that. And then, you know, we don't want to, you know, throw everything at our staff at once. And, you know, we said, yeah, that's, we're glad you're thinking about things in those ways because every change you make in IT takes time for the organization to really absorb and adjust to. So even something as simple as changing your, um, you know, like your website, you may think, well, that doesn't impact a lot of people, but at the end of the day, like it, it, it has an impact on the organization as a whole and it takes up people's time. So just kind of thinking about, um, you know, the impact that IT initiatives and the IT roadmap itself is going to have on the organization um, is really important. The one other area that I'll just mention as an illustration is cybersecurity. And cybersecurity is something that um, I think, you know, there's a there's sort of a misconception, and, and I think this has been somewhat perpetrated by the cybersecurity tools industry. You know, there's a lot of fancy cybersecurity tools out there. They, some of them are very expensive. And there's sort of this misconception that just buy this technology and you'll be safe. And the reality is like developing a cybersecurity program is really complex endeavor and it touches on all aspects of the organization. So what is your organization's liability? What compliance requirements, you know, regulatory compliance is the organization um, required to follow? Um, how much cybersecurity insurance does the organization have? Um, what are the costs, potential costs of a breach? What's the impact of that? And then how does that impact how much the organization should be in investing in cybersecurity? And what organizational policies need to be developed in order for those cybersecurity solutions to be effective? So right there, I just talked about legal, finance, operations, HR. You know, it's not just IT. IT is just one part of a much larger whole. So it is, it's important for IT to understand that though, because if, if it doesn't, then, you know, you run the risk of the IT leader or the IT department, just coming to the executive team with a solution and saying, Hey, like, we need to buy this solution to be protected. And then they're missing the much larger picture, you know, that needs to be addressed. Johan, I think you just brought up something really important about uh, IT leaders have to be conversant in the, the organization's work, in the organization's business, in the organization's processes. Um, it, it's, it's vital for IT leaders and technology leaders and data leaders to uh, not just view their roles as technology roles because technology does not live in a silo. Effective technology requires leadership and governance and process and and if you've ever listened to you know a build webinar or you're a build client you hear this a lot but it's related to all of those things so it's so important for a leader to be conversant in what the organization does how why what the objectives are and to to remain closely in touch with that one of the things that we'll do if we're playing like a an interim or part-time cio role for organizations what we'll do at build is try to make sure we build in a, a routine for check-ins with the different business leaders in, in the organization. And some of that routine is driven by, you know, there's an annual planning and coming out of the annual planning, you wanna understand what are the organizational priorities for the year? What, what are the work plans for the year? But then also you wanna stay, stay synced up throughout the course of the year to understand what's working, what's not working. And so those are really important, making sure that your relationship with the business units is not just a, a help desk relationship, if you will. Um, and then just to add a couple of examples, how organizational strategy drives IT strategy. I thought the cybersecurity topic, that was a, a, a great example, Johan. Just a couple of other quick ones, like even if the organization is anticipating, look, this is going to be a tougher year on the revenue side. Uh, that's the way in which, um, you know, the organizational strategy to, you know, minimize costs a bit this year is going to inform your, your technology strategy. If the organization is starting a new program, uh, well, do we know how we're going to measure success? Uh, what data do we need to capture to measure that success? Uh, how are we going to capture it? Where are we going to capture it? That's you know a way that the organization strategy has to drive uh, technology decisions and data governance decisions. 
uh, or if there are especially ambitious fundraising goals for the year? What does that mean for uh, what we need to do with the CRM or our, our digital engagement capabilities? So uh, those are all ways that like business needs, IT needs, um, it's such a close relationship. And the final thing I'll say, if anyone's here who's not in IT, and I guess that's a third of the audience, it is important for IT to have a voice at that table while the planning is going on. There is an, uh, a very iterative relationship between plans and technology and how those things work together um, for the organization. Yeah, I, I mean, it really needs to be a collaborative relationship. And, and you know that's why we have this arrow going both ways on the title of this slide. Because I think oftentimes the rest of the leadership of the organization sort of feels like, well, I can't, I don't understand IT. I don't really know technology. That's not my background. Just tell us what to do or just tell us what we need. As if it kind of goes both ways. Like on the one hand, IT too often, you know, is, is you know, um, oblivious to the business needs of the organization. But in the same way, oftentimes organizational leadership doesn't recognize the impact that IT has on the rest of the organization. And so it, it does need to be um, a dialogue, you know, and because the, the IT needs need to be sort of feathered in um, to the overall organizational plan. And, it, and that can go wrong in, in multiple ways. If the, you, the last thing you wanna do is give IT a blank check. Don't say here's the here's you know the amount of money that you have, go do what you want with it you know because you'll run the risk of getting technology solutions that don't really meet the needs of the organization. Um, but by the same token, you don't want to um, limit IT sort of without understanding, like as part of the organization's budget development process, there should be budgetary input from the IT department. But that. Those budget requests have to be justified, but that justification begins a process of dialogue to help the senior leadership understand, like it's important that we replace this equipment this year, or it's important that we move to this new solution this year. And here's why, here's how it affects the rest of the organization's goals. Because if that dialogue isn't happening, then it's just a bunch of, you know, it's just costs and then you know, and, and nonprofits are often in the position of having to really monitor their costs and in many cases cut costs, um, restrict costs, you know, because, you know, they they just have very real um, resource constraints. And so if IT is not having that dialogue with the rest of the business, then it just appears as a cost center and there's no sort of value associated with what is should be an investment, you know, in the the core foundation of the organization. Thank you, Johan. That's great. I, I remember you saying once that if you show me your budget, you'll know your priorities. Um, and I feel like that's a that's a good way to to put it. I want to make sure we have time to talk about the three leadership traits to cultivate. So um, people are here in this presentation looking for some things that they can work on. And I know, David, you, you um, had talked about these dates and I wondered if you wanted to kick us off um, in, in talking more about them. Yeah, sure thing. And, and maybe it would help to take them uh, one at a time. So maybe we switch back and forth on this one, Johan. But I, I think, you know, one of, the, uh, one of the most important things for a leader to be able to do is to figure out what's important. Uh, and that's what we're talking about here with the, the prioritized topic. Uh, but separating the meaningful from you know the noise, finding the information and the noise, finding the stuff that we really need to focus on, hone in on. Uh, and I emphasize this because almost everyone I meet, certainly almost all the leaders I meet, feel like there's more to do than there are resources or team members or time to do. I, I think one of the tendencies of a leader is to uh, add to team members' responsibilities without seriously thinking about what can team members stop doing, right? And uh, I think that's one of the, the most difficult things for all of us to learn and especially leaders to learn that's a vital, vital competency to, uh, to cultivate. Um, and I, I'll just say one more thing, and then Johan, I'm interested in your thoughts. I think one of the things that Build will will do, thank you for the shout out, Carolyn, in the chat for uh, some of the change management templates, but 
one of the tools we'll use is a uh, like a change readiness assessment. And one of the things that we look at in there is just what, what are all the initiatives going on right now in an organization? Can an organization take on a new change? Um, and I think that's really important to have that big perspective as a leader when you're trying to figure out, can we add something else and what can we not do or what can we delay? Yeah, I think working on your ability to prioritize is a great, if you're interested in moving into leadership roles, if you're in a leadership role and you're growing, um, focusing on your ability to prioritize, prioritize is, is really important because it's, it's really about your ability to make decisions, which is kind of the, one of the essential things that a leader does. So if you're the manager of a team, you're prioritizing what that team is focusing on. And you're basically making a decision about what the team is going to do. If you're the director of a department, it's the same thing. You're making decisions about what the department is going to do. And the ability to make good decisions is something that you're not just born with. Like you learn that over time because you're not gonna make good decisions all the time. Like you're gonna, there are times where you're gonna make decisions that maybe weren't the best decision. Um, but learning how to make decisions is a really important part of becoming a leader, gathering all of the information and understanding the trade-offs. If, if there weren't trade-offs involved, it wouldn't actually require a decision. So anytime you're making a decision, anytime you're having to prioritize, what you're doing is you're making a trade-off between two courses of action. And that is a difficult position to be in, um, but that's kind of at the heart of what of what leaders are doing. And that helps with that IT roadmap dis discussion because you need to present the, basically when you're providing the IT roadmap, you're providing a prioritized list of IT initiatives and you're telling the organization, this, these things need to be prioritized in our time, in our, in our expenses. And in order to make the case, you have to understand the trade-off that the organization is making to pick that roadmap over not doing that roadmap. So really gaining like facility with trade-offs and how to make decisions around trade-offs is a, is a key leadership trait. And we all make decisions in our own individual lives. We make decisions in our professional lives and just being more aware of that is a good way of, of cultivating that trait. I'm gonna quickly add something to that as well, which is uh, there is an, an art or a competency to decision-making around uh, how much time should I invest and how long can I take to make a decision? Some decisions you're best served to make a, a quick decision maybe because people are waiting on it and things are gonna stop until you can you know, point people in the right direction. Uh, and when does a decision really warrant uh, a lot of participation? And uh, you know, maybe it's necessary to gain buy-in for a big decision that's gonna affect everyone. So I think that's something to cultivate uh, and, and to reflect on if you're a, uh, a leader trying to figure out you know, what are the different ways I need to, to make decisions and how quickly do I need to make decisions? Well, I think the, the second point here is around setting the example. Um, and, and the main thing I wanted to say here is just projects work best and initiatives work best and leadership works best, in my opinion, when leaders do what they're asking others to do. Uh, and what I mean by that, uh, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, I was talking with a client about, um, believe it or not, there are some organizations that do still meet in person and do uh, use conference rooms. And we were talking about the reservation system for a conference room. Uh, and I can't tell you how many times I'll see an organization that will go to the effort to set up something like that. It's never too easy to set up. And then once they set it up and people start using it, uh, a senior person in the organization will come kick people out of a conference room that they've reserved. This is not an uncommon situation, but it's the prime example of uh, leadership undermining uh, themselves and uh, not setting the example of what they want staff to do. Um, but I think it's also true in other scenarios that are maybe a little more common, like tracking constituent interactions in a CRM. If it's really important for your organization to start using data from the CRM to make decisions and you're asking everyone else to track certain interactions in there, then as a leader, you absolutely need to be doing that too uh, for, for 
leaders who don't feel like they can do that or don't find a way to do that, even if it's through an assistant or something like that, you're really undermining your effectiveness as a leader. And so uh, a, a shout out to those leaders who, who do realize the importance of setting the example for the behavior they want uh, in their organization. Yeah, that's that's so important. I lead by example. That's a, and that's a great example of um, how leaders can undermine themselves and what they're trying to accomplish by, by the example that they set. Um, I think another thing that leaders can do well is not feel like they have to have all the answers. You know, like one of the one of the things that we talked about earlier is the importance of learning, and that to being an effective leader is being a, a lifelong learner. And it's great to demonstrate that to the people around you. You know, if if the other um, members of your team, other leaders in your organization, um, see you learning, then it, it it represents that you know aspect of leadership really well. And some of the the absolute best um, contacts that I've worked with over the years, um, operations leaders are the ones who ask the most questions. You know, I'll, I'll explain a technical concept to them and they say, I don't get it, explain it to me again. <laughs> you know, okay, okay, well, I don't understand that. What does that mean? And just pushing me to really explain it in a way that um, is understandable, you know, by, by operations um, and finance professionals. And, and, and it was a fearlessness you know, and they'd even say like, look, I'm done when it comes to IT. And the reality was they weren't like they really, by asking the questions and continually asking the questions and wanting to learn and demonstrating that they wanted to learn, they they did, you know, and as a result, they ended up making always made like really good decisions related to IT for the organization. I think our, uh, our last point here was around uh, accountability. I think uh, one of the the key things it's saying here is just the importance of, you know, accountability is, yes, it's about making sure that uh, other people are doing what they're supposed to. And it's also about making sure that that we as leaders are also doing what we're su supposed to. Um, you know, uh, are, are am I holding myself accountable to doing the training, the cybersecurity training, for example, going back to an earlier topic that I'm asking uh, uh, my colleagues in the organization to do? Um, Am I uh, entering that interaction with a contact in the CRM? Uh, but I, I think, you know, I also wanted to say something different about accountability, which is that, you know, first, uh, I think people have to understand what they're being held accountable to. And so the, the onus is on the leader to really clearly communicate the vision and expectations, uh, to make time to, to make sure that those things are clear, uh, to act as a champion, for uh, that vision, those expectations to make sure that it continues to be communicated. Uh, but then it's really important to build in ways to see if it's working. Uh, I, I, so let's, to, to use like a business systems example uh, and going back to the CRM example, if it's that we're gonna start to use CRMs to track, uh, a CRM to track our interaction with constituents, what are the ways that we're building in to see if that's actually actually happening? And what are the ways that we're building in to get useful, actionable data from that? Um, so uh, I think that's part of accountability, finding ways to put to use those things that you're implementing. Uh, build it into your weekly meeting. Like uh, if, if you're reviewing um, uh, prospective major donors, uh, make some time to show a dashboard at your team meeting and, and build in kind of that accountability to the group around look we need to this this needs to be a live dynamic real time tool that we're using because we're all going to be looking at it at the team meeting uh, it's not something that we do later and uh, catch up on i love those examples dave because i think oftentimes when people hear the word accountability they immediately think of uncomfortable conversations and like ah, i don't want to have an uncomfortable conversation it's like well no nobody does really um but accountability is so much more than that. And you really need accountability structures and accountability systems. And that's, you know, that's what I hear you saying in the examples that you were, that you were using. Um, and, you know, an example from, from my world is a ticketing system, you know, just having all of the IT issues that need to be solved for an organization in one place and having those um, issues documented and then assigned to somebody to resolve 
is a system. It's a, that's a system of accountability. And then having a weekly meeting to go through those tickets and check on the status of their resolution is an accountability structure. And that's a very simple example, but ultimately leaders are responsible for building and ma maintaining those systems and structures of accountability. And, and hopefully if you're getting started in your career as an IT leader, you're moving into a, um, a role where some of those systems and structures are already in place, but um, oftentimes they have to be changed, they evolve over time, and sometimes they have to be created um, from scratch as well. I wanted to jump in and make sure to say that accountability doesn't have to always be somebody who wasn't doing what they were supposed to be doing. Like if you don't have a way to check that things are being done, you don't have a way to praise the people, the staff who took the training and are doing the thing, the new way that they're supposed to be doing it. So it's really important from that standpoint as well to make sure that people know when they're, they're doing a good job, you know, I'm going to, um, go back and uh, revisit our learning objectives, which I think we did a pretty good job of, um, of hitting that we wanted to discuss um, career paths and identifying new leaders of IT at nonprofits. We wanted to talk, we talked a lot about how to, if you're an IT person, how to find resources to grow into a management role. If you're a manager um, or director, uh, even a C-level um, um, uh, leader, ways to be able to improve your IT understanding and, um, and understand and, and be able to manage that as well. Um, understanding the importance of IT leaders, learning to match real business needs with your IT roadmap and your strategy. And I think you guys both touched on that in, in great ways. And then learning the importance of prioritizing, setting the example and holding yourself accountable and having those accountability systems. So that was a really good um, conversation there. David and Johan, did you have any, um, any last words you wanted to talk about? I just had one resource to share. I don't think it uh, made it into the general chat, but uh, for people looking for webinars to kind of uh, supplement their journey to uh, becoming managers and leaders then uh, or just just online training courses and pre-recorded materials then LinkedIn learning is certainly a good resource I'm sure everyone's heard of that one there's another uh, another one called udemy u d e m y for people who aren't familiar with that that also has some some good resources as well there are many sources out there but I just wanted to give a shout out to a couple in case people just need a place to start I'll make sure to put those in the transcript um, when we when we post that with the video and the podcast. Johan? Yeah, just as a fi some final thoughts. Um, if you don't come from an IT background, didn't come from an IT background, but you're in a leadership position at a nonprofit, I strongly encourage you to do what you can to learn more about IT. Um, the more you learn about IT, the more effective a leader you're going to be for your nonprofit. And if you if you're in IT and you're thinking about moving or you, you you're thinking about exploring a possible leadership role, I strongly encourage you to do that. There's a, a kind of a desperate need in my experience for um, strong IT leaders at nonprofit organizations. And um, you know you don't necessarily have to have the manager title to start working on your leadership skills. So I hope that um, you know, we've given you some good ideas today of things you can, you can look at and pursue. And if you're thinking about going the leadership route as an IT person, I, I encourage you to do that. Thank you so much. And I think both of you are, are very willing to take questions um, offline as well. So people can find you on your websites and contact you with maybe some further um, ideas or, or information that they, they would like to ask you about. And I just want to thank you, David and Johan, for sharing your time with us today. I just, um, what a wonderful conversation. I feel like this was very, very helpful to me personally, but also I, I feel like this is going to be very um, helpful to, to the people who can see it on our website. So thank you again for your time. Thank you everybody who joined us today. We really appreciate it. And, um, and, We'll let you go on your way. Thanks again.